When did you first come up with dilation theory? I think the first inklings of it started when I was a boy, when I was a teenager, about 13 years old, after I uh, watched something quite fantastic in the skies above my family home. What did you actually witness on that evening? We were gathered having a family barbecue and um, uh, witnessed a strange glowing light in the, the, the sky that was in a place that it shouldn't have been. It was near Heathrow Airport, so uh, I grew up essentially with uh, aircraft uh, doing their usual thing that they do on the evening. So you get to realise what is and what is not an aircraft, and this was not of the usual sort of uh, thing that you would see. And it left our atmosphere rep rapidly upon uh, discussion. So it was uh, lots of people witnessed this event. So in what way did that spawn the idea of dilation theory? Well, if we uh, consider speed, time and distance, what this thing did essentially defied the laws of physics as I understood them. I was quite good at physics from a very young age. Long story. But what I essentially discovered in my own thinking at that moment was that this thing must be going uh, in a different relative rate of time, i.e. a faster rate of time rather than speed uh, as such. Um, that then led to me uh, thinking about time in a more flexible way, in that time can speed up and time can slow down and, and so on, and start that pursuit essentially about inquiring about what are the true attributes of time? What does the phenomenon inform us about time? Well, essentially, it informs us that time can speed up and that time, as we know already, can slow down. We see this with black holes and other phenomena in the universe. What it also informs us is that time is relative in that other things essentially can have different rates of time in that you can have a different rate of time than me, for example. I like to use the analogy of the dragonfly. It's uh, really good for this. Um, essentially, dragonflies exist in a relative faster rate of time than me and you uh, in that they are much simpler in form and uh, therefore we see this as a whizzing around catching flies in the air and perhaps even they experience a relative faster rate of time than even flies. If we can imagine our dragonfly to be having a, a wristwatch, if we were to be able to view upon that wristwatch on his wrist, it would be spinning at an incredible rate of time. But to him, it would just be normal tick-tock seconds. So it holds a faster relative rate of time? Yes, essentially. A much faster relative rate of time than us. So how does it achieve a faster relative rate of time? Well, my thinking is that it's uh, an implementation of a conservational nature of the universe. And um, I have some ideas on this uh, that I form into a thing I call dynamic behaviourism. In that our properties denote our behavioural outcomes and that this uh, works independently of scales. If one holds the properties of quanta, for example, one will hold the phase of quanta, leading to supersized objects and entities that hold transitional phases that we are not used to seeing at super scales. Recent LIGO results gave us a good indication that uh, the hypothesis is correct, in that uh, neutron stars uh, do indeed hold a phase of quanta. One could consider them essentially uh, supersized atoms. So a star with the behaviour of an atom? Yes, our properties denote the behaviour. Neutron stars have an extended electron cloud and as such hold the properties of quanta. And as such a kin turn are given the phase of quanta. Now, the phase of quanta in my thinking holds a much faster relative rate of time. Your theory suggests that this has a relationship to the inertia of gravity. Can you explain? Well, one of those really odd attributes of time is that time holds a fluidity, in that 
The slower one's relative rate of time, the greater the inertia of gravity, and the faster one's relative rate of time, the lower the inertia of gravity. Now, we can use the analogies of fluid dynamics because actually that's what's going on. And we could consider, therefore, that time itself is governed by the laws of conservation and is itself essentially a fluid symmetry. Therefore, if one holds a relative rate of time faster than one's surroundings, one will experience zero g. Um, we have to take you to a river to explore those fluid dynamics at work um, that we're more familiar with. If we look to the banks, the slowing of the flow, it gathers the potsam uh, by a passive transversal inertia effect upon the flow, caused by that stress to the flow. In the centre of the stream, the fastest flow in the stream, there is no inertia. Therefore, there is no anti-gravity as such. There is only zero g to the extreme gravities that we see, where time is essentially almost stopped at black holes, that level of gravity. Considering these new ideas concerning time, how do they provide unification? They provide some resolutions, essentially, to gravity and to quantum gravity, in that um, we will not find a quantization of gravity in the effect of a graviton, for example, but we will see the effects of gravity on quanta, and that should be realized in a tilt to the spin of quanta, in that dilation stress is applied um, and causes a tilt to the spin. Um, we call this thing a time tensor, and essentially what it describes now black holes has is a time tensor cascade, where essentially a moment of time cannot come to a determination of its quantum information, and that essentially time is paused, as it were, quietly contemplating away, and that sometime they will reach a final resolution of that moment in time and, and blurt out that long-forgotten moment. Can these ideas of quantum information provide resolution for the two theories of relativity? Yes, essentially, if we step down to the contextuality of quantum information, we can unify them in the context of uh, the complexities of our quantum information determination denote our dilation, and dilation stress denotes gravity. You mention contextuality as opposed to dimensionality. Is there a specific reason for this? Yes, dimensionality should be restricted to the language of the four dimensions of space and time. Anything more than that really should refer to things in the form of contextuality, in that our emergent time itself is born of what one could consider a parental contextual domain that our contextual duality is one is a virtual fluid-like representation as discussed, that fluidity of time essentially, and one is an abstraction of that fluidity in time within an eternal dynamic moment that one could consider being a now. And that dynamic moment essentially again leads to that modus operandi, that emergent modus operandi that I they use the term of dynamic behaviourism. What is a good way of perceiving those contextualities? We can use the analogies of your computer. The internet, for example, is a contextually virtual domain, a domain of information, but nevertheless virtual in its context. What you see upon your screen is an abstraction of that contextual domain of information. So, what is the cosmos? It's quite the rabbit hole. A contextual continuum of geometric symmetries within symmetries projected upon a gauge lattice. Essentially, a holographic continuum. So, a creation, a construct, would it therefore require a constructor? Any construct as such requires a constructor, but then we get into the 
chicken and egg scenario and, and therefore we, it never ends as such who, who what gave life to that gave life to that gave life to that and so on and so on and never ending essentially but then again it seems to have this uh, continuum but also follows a Copernican principle at its heart essentially as well does this give us Star Trek now? <laughs>